I think we're at time here, Amanda. Um, if you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, feel free to say hi in the chat. Uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, throughout the, uh, Amanda's presentation, I will switch off my audio and video, but I will still be here in the background. I'll take note of any questions that you'd like to post um, in the chat. And then after the talk, we will uh, go through um, a Q&A. So um, I'll hand over to you, Amanda. Great, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully there's not an echo or anything. Are, is the audio visual good on your side? Everything looks good on my side, yeah. Okay, great, great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, joining today. I wanted to go to this uh, um, conference a couple of years ago and my old job was like, oh, we don't have the budget and now I'm presenting at it. So <laughs> now I'm, I'm in Seattle. I'll go ahead and uh, show my, my slides. Uh, this is me, and you can see the Space Needle in the background. Uh, this is my, I feel like people always have their profile pictures of them, like on a mountain or something. I was just in a park. I did not, I took a bus there, so I didn't scale this or anything. But um, just to let you know a little bit about me, um, I'm, if my D&D &D alignment is neutral good, if that is informative, uh, I have a pretty varied background. So, you know, I've been doing research for about six and a half years, six plus years. And I have lots of experience to, you know, experience adjacent things before that. Like, for example, I was a music designer. Um, you know, like how, how things feel to people is something that I'm always interested in. Um, so, and, you know, often UXers come from many paths and it makes us a really vibrant and varied bunch and really useful, I think. So happy to be here, happy to be doing this, happy to have found this. Um, my first role was a uh, cloud-based POS company doing it, you know, officially on paper as a UXer. Um, and there was a little fledgling UX team that had been in practice about a year. They were composed of designers. Uh, I have an amazing and wonderful colleague named Susan, who's actually out in the audience somewhere today. Uh, she was the one who looked and saw that we needed to start up a research program. So her and I built that. Uh, together, we built a good foundation there, and then uh, her and I actually both moved on to different places, but I moved to my current position where, um, you know, I went from cloud-based POS to now my current industry is heavy building materials. So, um, you know, this company that I'm currently at had zero formal UX before, <laughs> so this is my second rodeo in starting up UX. Uh, this time it, it was just me by myself as the sole researcher and I've got two designers uh, alongside and we're slowly building out the, the um, team and I've been there about uh, maybe six, seven months so far. Um, so these two industries are pretty different, but they also have similarities. They both have very robust functionality in the product offerings, but they both, you know, need to be easy to use. So there are some some overlap there in the Venn diagram between my two roles here, but I've been a researcher in both places. Um, you know, and, and often robust features need a simple UI because we're all still human beings at the end of the day. And like, that's the thing that's a little hard for some companies to learn, but it's like, okay, you know, we need to make everything as usable as we can. Um, so, you know, my users used to be people behind, you know, that were working in a restaurant behind the counter. Now it's a cement truck driver or concrete truck driver. So. Uh, you know, all of those things, different people, but similar needs, similar different industries, but, you know, UX is kind of everything has UX in it, as we know, like anything human beings touch needs the user experience uh, treatment. So i um, happy to be here doing that here. Uh, and, you know, that's who I'm always in it for is the users. I mean, there's business needs and all, of course, but like the users are the people that I'm always here and most interested in. So for today's session, um, you know, we're going to go through, you know, we'll do an introduction, uh, kind of starting out when you first get established what to do, kind of where, where to start, um, working with other people from other teams, kind of showing the UX value or kind of getting into to where that lies, um, how to, you know, sharing your learnings and that kind of thing, and then we'll wrap up there at the end. I talk uh, fast and I talk a lot, so I have no idea what speed this is going to go at. I usually try to slow down, uh, but uh, forgive me if I'm being too quick and uh, I'll try to, to pace, pace myself for this. 
Um, but yeah, I'm hopefully this is what I've learned so far. So this, you know, is like, of course, just my experience. So hopefully it'll be able to help some of you as you like either are building out a team yourself or if you're the researcher that's going in and trying to figure out the landscape and what to do. So uh, without further ado, my first slide. Uh, so I watched The Thing for the first time a couple of years ago uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we've been through a lot. And I think his, his quote here really spoke to me, how nobody trusts anybody and we're all very tired. Um, so, you know, we've been through a great deal. Uh, the tech industry has been through a great deal. Well, the tech industry was relatively safe, as you guys all know, probably. Uh, it was even booming during the pandemic. But now there have been some kind of course corrections. You know, now there are some some good and bad bets that are coming to, to pay. And, uh, you know, like there have been lots of layoffs from lots of big names, as I'm sure you've seen me being here in Seattle. I'm right next to Google, um, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, all of those guys are here. There's Apple presence. Um, you know, a lot of tech workers have been laid off. And, you know, for this very nihilistic uh, practical special effects horror movie, you're probably wondering how I'm going to get positive about this. but. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very gross, by the way. If you haven't seen this movie, it is very gross, but it's a good movie. So I'll let you decide, uh, you know, what you're going to do there. Um, but, you know, something else was also happening during all of this. Smaller businesses and businesses that aren't in industries that are necessarily that you would think of when you think of tech. So all of those big names are the fan companies, you know. Um, so build businesses like mine, heavy building materials. You don't necessarily consider them to be tech leaders, but they were all kind of like looking and realizing that in order to stay relevant and not get left in the dust, they're going to need, um, you know, to up their tech, you know, grocery ordering was really prominent during the pandemic that really grew video conferencing really grew. There are all of these industries. And I mean, there are ones that have always needed help. For example, healthcare, you know, logging into healthcare portals, all of these different industries that have either not had tech before, or their tech is just like, you know, really tired and not usable and kind of built on these old fashioned things. Uh, everybody was kind of having this awakening and reckoning that like, hey, to keep up and not be left in the dust, we need to be relevant. We need to have a good user experience. The bar is higher now. Everybody expects things to work and they expect things to be usable, accessible, all of those good things that we can bring. So, you know, in light of that, you might be, you know, if you're one of the people that got laid off or not, uh, you know, you might be seeing these opportunities in these places where you haven't seen user experience before, or, you know, you haven't really seen a lot of tech presence before. So it's a really interesting time for us to be able to see where we can embark out into the world and make that difference, you know, like see where we can add that help because there are so many problems to solve. And as we get more and more into the tech stratosphere, as it touches more parts of our lives, that's only more and more opportunities for us to get involved and be able to offer people good experiences because that's what we know. Um, so lots and lots of potential. Um, and, you know, everybody wants things to be usable, but, you know, dare I say delightful. So we're marching towards that. Uh, I recently read this book called um, The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control. The author here, she's very smart. She's very, she worked at Google before. Um, I would suggest reading this if you have any perfectionist leanings. Um, I discovered that I am, which is unsurprising. I'm one of the types. I'm a procrastinator perfectionist. So there's that. So shout out to anybody else that is. <laughs> but when I was reading this, I also noticed that UXers are very much cut from the same cloth. We have the same ethos. You know, we can see the current state of the current experience and the intention and the ideal of what it could be, uh, how, you know, what's like, not necessarily even the happy path, but what's like the great experience and what's that distance between the two? How can we get our users from uh, where they currently are, where they might have struggles and frustrations to, um, you know, up to that great experience level? Because that's what we want for all of our users. So, um, you know, we want a better world and we can influence it one product at a time. And that's really noble and exciting. And I think that's, uh, you know, something that I like to do when I wake up every day. So I'm happy to be part of that world. And that's something that we can bring to any industry. It's something that we can bring to any situation that we're in. So, again, this is kind of a, a very unique time for us to be able to, to see you know, make sure that there's balance between the human side and the tech side and like make sure that the, 
that humans aren't forgotten about and that we make things that are usable for us because we're we live in this world too you know um so we have this unique bent to be able to make our users lives easier less frustrating uh excited to do that so um getting started but now that you've gotten to this new job um you know you kind of have to look around and see what's going on um you might you might show up somewhere that you're in an industry that has a head start with an existing team you might have access to ux writers interaction designers uh you know product marketing people like all these you might have a fully robust team with lots of support and that's wonderful or it might just be you <laughs> it might just be you or one other person or you and a couple of designers so you kind of you know need to see you know where you can build from there um, you might be introducing the entire concept of the field to your organization. And user experience has been around, I mean, as long as people have. It's, you know, it's uh, Don Norman coined the term UX in the 90s. I mean, you know, we've, it's been around for a minute, you know, but people don't necessarily, I feel like our industry is still a little bit kind of fledgling, a little bit new as a concept, you know, aside from like sales and marketing, you know, us. Uh, being intentional about the experience because we all know that there is one whether you design it or not and it's usually not great by accident so knowing that your need is um, you know they brought you in for a reason they you know there was a gap there was they knew that they needed user experience in some kind of way whether or not they knew that they just needed a team because you're supposed to have one or whether or not they were like hey we've really got to check in with our users so, uh, you know, more, more likely than not, if you're in this session, you're on the right hand side where it's just you or a couple of people and you guys are just starting out, um, you know, and you don't have the benefit of having all of that. Uh, there's established, you know, roles, resources, uh, you know, all of the research ops stuff that already exists um, in place. You might have to be a little more kind of scrappy and kind of, um, you know, forward it out on your own, which is also exciting because then you get to really put your mark on it and, and form it to the way that you see fit. And you're not kind of like stuck in these old, uh, not saying that, I mean, you know, tech companies are by definition, you know, we're all innovative and everything, but I just mean you aren't beholden to the way that things already are. There's not as much inertia on top of you so that you, you can be a little more nimble and kind of look around. Um, so we'll get into that also a little further here. So the most important thing that you're going to keep coming back to the entire time, the thing that you always, we always want to remember is who are your users and what do they need? You know, this is going to be your guiding principle, whether you have a team or not. Um, you're going to be learning uh, two important things in the first few weeks and months. Uh, so you're going to learn as much as you can about the users and their current experience, learning about your products. Uh, that's paramount. Of course, you're going to need that baseline knowledge. But you're also going to be doing kind of like a service design aspect of this too if you're new if the the ux frontier is new or research itself is new to your organization so you're going to be looking at your stakeholders i feel like that word might be a little overused but looking at all of the people involved that have an interest in what you're doing uh your internal teams you know you're going to be uh who are your ux research users you're the researcher so who are your users internally and externally um, and what do they need, as well as, you know, your user, you, your customers, your users, the ones, you know, the, the people that you're going to sit and do interviews with and all that kind of thing. So, you know, internally, the people that are around you that are going to be using the things that you're going to produce, what are their own KPIs? What are their business objectives? Um, what's the company vision? That kind of stuff is stuff that you're going to need to figure out because, you know, you're going to need to make sure that you're fitting what you're doing is serving that ecosystem and those unique needs. And they might not be the same as something that you did at your old organization, especially if the size of the teams is different. Um, sometimes they themselves aren't clear. Sometimes you can ask five different people at five different levels and they'll have five different things. So, you know, it's not always easy to tease out. Like you, you would think that it would just be like stamped on the side of a, a billboard or something like this is our company and this is what we do. But sometimes, it's all over the place. So you have to kind of like do a little detective work and make sure that uh, you're at least clear on what the company is trying to do and that what you're doing is in service of that vision. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to meet and talk with as many groups as you can. You want to build out that baseline knowledge of the inside, um, you know, as you know, you want to find your footing. Um, you it may not be organized or given 
you know, it might in theory, you know, people would think that there's some kind of like, uh, you know, onboarding process or something, but sometimes there might not be. And if there isn't, then that's a chance for you to do it. You know, you can learn. And something I've tried to do in my organizations is, um, you know, if the resource isn't there, I try to create it for the person that comes in that's new behind me <laughs> so that, you know, it can be a little more of a softer landing if there's foundational stuff like, you know, what acronyms mean, that kind of thing. Um, so if you can make that kind of thing for the person that's coming up behind you, um, even if they're totally not in your department, it still might help them uh, have an easier time. So already, you know, you're trying to like help with the experience because it all matters. Um, but, you know, you're here to observe, synthesize, you know, this is your wheelhouse. You know how to do research. You know how to find out who your users are and what do they need. So really just thinking about turning it inside and for your own purposes, doing this as kind of a research project, like looking at your company, looking at the products that you make and researching those the same way that you might your external products for your external customers uh, is useful as you're getting your footing of figuring out where you can really uh, add the most value with your work that you're doing here. So teamwork, uh, you want others to join your cause. Um, unlike reality competitions, you're here to make friends you know, or at least colleagues, uh, you want people on your side. So, it, you know, it's a little bit different that we're not in person. When I started my previous job, I had a great boss that was like, you know, let's go visit everybody's office. Let's go talk to all these people. And, you know, I, I know there are studies that for people that are new employees at, uh, at companies, it's a little harder for them to onboard than they would if they were in person, but it's not impossible. Like there are still plenty of chat uh, there's Teams or Slack, and you know, if your company has happy hours, you know, still plenty of ways that you can kind of get to know everybody. Uh, writing them down helps because I'm terrible with names. Uh, so you want to get to know everyone and understand the value that they're bringing to the table as well. Um, you know, you want to know how you, that it can weave together with what you're doing. So this is your chance to ask all of those starter questions. They're not like dumb, but you know, like the starter beginner questions, that beginner mindset. Um, you know, you want to watch demos if they exist, all of that kind of thing. Um, it's really important to let teams know that you're here to add and not take away. Um, you know, if they've gotten these great relationships already established with users, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's a great place to start. That's my current situation. Everybody already talks to the users regularly, which is great. It's just that they're doing it with a different mindset than you might be doing it. Like there was a need for you as a researcher to come in so, you know, like, where can you add that value again? So, um, you know, you want to let them know that you're here to help them. Uh, you know, the work that you're going to do with research will make the products better, easier to sell, easier to support. Um, you're going to help devs not have to do things twice. Uh, they have very valuable hours that you don't want to get thrown away. Um, so, you know, you're helping the company's bottom line, but you're also helping the users and you're helping your internal teams uh, to not have to do repeat work, to make things go a little smoother, all of that kind of stuff. So you just want to kind of convey that value um, and the fact that you're not here to just be like, well, you can't talk to users because I'm here and only I can do that. That's not true. Um, you want them to know that you're here to to help them and to, and especially your boss, you know, you want to help your boss do their job better. You want to help everybody, you know, the things, the insights that you're going to bring from out in the field are going to be crucial and so imperative to making everything else work better. So, um, you know, you just want to, um, you know, help them. You're here to dive deeper and empower them to, to do that, to allow them to do that. So it's a great value add. You know, of course they want you here. So if you frame it that way, it helps. Um, also, if you want, you know, you're trying to build bridges, you're here to like, you know, help connect these dots. Devs don't usually get to go see users. They don't usually get to go, um, you know, hear about direct quotes from the users or see the videos. So that kind of stuff is what you're here to bring. Um, and, you know, we're here as resources and, you know, we are the user advocates. We're the experts on the current user experience, you know, who they are and what they need. But we don't need to belabor all of our methods to our colleagues. So they're more interested in your results than how you got there. Um, at first, if it's new, you may want to give them like a primer on like, here's what I'm doing or here's how I'm doing it. But you don't need to spend, uh, you know, eight slides at the beginning of a presentation of like, here's every single thing that we did, because there's not as much value in that. 
Um, Jared Spool, who if you guys don't know already, you should find and follow him. He's a wonderful resource, especially if you're just getting started in this field. But, um, you know, he's a great analogy about this is like taking your car in to get fixed. If you take your car in to get fixed, uh, you know, if you want them to go and show you around and what they're doing, they will. But otherwise, you take it in and then you go do something else and then they bring it back and they say you need a new water pump. You know, they don't show you all the wrenches. They don't point out every little thing that they're doing. They tr you trust them as an expert and they come back and bring you the thing at the end. So, you know, they're really, they, they're doing their own jobs. They're already busy. They just want your expertise and that's what you're here for. That's why you're so important. So, you know, you don't need to do a like how to UX uh, in every session. I've found in my experience that can be a little exhaustive so that people kind of tune out or they kind of get a different idea of it or, you know, I think it's much better if you can to show them, you know, and again, you can lift that curtain anytime they want to see anything that, you know, you, you can add executives to the mirror boards or, you know, whatever. Uh, and so that they can see the work in progress that helps sometimes if you're feeling a little precarious and like, you know, oh no, all these designers are cranking out designs. Uh, how do they know what I'm doing? If you ever want to show that it's there, but you know, when you're doing the summarization, the presentations, all of that kind of stuff, uh, you know, you need a little bit of it as far as like, you know, I went to this place and I talked to these people, but you don't have to like really get into it because they, you don't, they don't need to know all of that. That's a little too inside baseball. Um, you know, they're, they're already doing their job and this is, you, you don't need to train them to do your own job. Now, that being said, this isn't saying that you don't want to democratize. I know people get a little bit nervous with democratization, but if you especially are the only user there, you can't do everything. You know, you can't be the only person that does user interviews. So, you know, just, it's just finding a good balance there and like, you know, training them enough, um, but not also just teaching them every little thing. You know, if they want to go read the Nielsen Norman website, they can, or, you know, they can see all of your resources and stuff that you've made. Um, but yeah, just, uh, I feel like we do a lot of instructional stuff. So, you know, just kind of thinking about like, maybe we need to not do that as much. <laughs> maybe we need to not train them as much on it. Uh, we can just bring the awareness to them of what the users are thinking, feeling, doing, what they need. Um, so uh, yeah, so moving along, I think I'm already going. I don't um, wanna have enough time for everything. So again, who are users, what do they need? So, you know, if you have a repository, is anybody using it? Uh, if you have personas, do they look at them once? Uh, does the maturity scale matter? Does it matter if you're, you know, the fledgling that's just, I mean, it does to you, but it doesn't matter as much in the grand scheme of things. It's not like, okay, me, I have to pull the entire organization up to a level five. You know, they are where they are. Um, you know, are they getting the insights? When you present them to them, are they receiving them? Are you doing it in the classic way? And then they're just not getting the information because if so, then that's not the right way to do it. They really you need to present things in such a way that they can get it because they're your users. You need to make sure that they're understanding what you're putting down. Um, you know, compliance, GDPR in Europe, CCPA in California, accessibility. If you do research participation agreements, you want to do as much of that as you possibly can, especially on the accessibility side. But, you know, you want to dot your your T's or wait cross your T's and dot your I's. Uh, you want them to be able to, uh, you want to do your due diligence as the representative if you can. I've had some friction in the past where it's a little bit harder to get time with legal to be able to write up a research participation agreement, but it's always best to try to get these things in there because you really want to be compliant, you really want to cover your bases, and you really want to be the person that's the expert to like know that they need these things. They need to be compliant. So. Do your level best to get that in if you can. Um, if you're, when you're sharing things, is a deck the best way? Is a report the best way? What are their KPIs? Are they wanting just like a graphic? Um, and you know, different audiences have different needs as far as like, you know, an executive is going to want a summary with bullet points or a one sheeter. But you don't have to be too married to the way that things. Uh, some of the, the deliverables that we pull out. Um, do what works for your audience and what works for your organization. Um, you know, a lot of organizations talking about repositories, heavy hitters like Okta and Microsoft still haven't figured it out. Microsoft is building their own, but you know, nobody's gotten it exactly right yet. So, you know, I don't really have the right answer here as far as that goes, but I want to ask the question of what your repository needs to be. 
uh, you know, does it just need to be a file structure? Does it need to be, I mean, it can get so big that it's something that a person has to spend their full time managing and you might not have the bandwidth to do that. So, you know, can you just make something simple in Google? Um, whatever you make, just make sure that it's usable to, to you and by extension, you know, your product people. If you're labeling things, you don't have to label it like, um, I don't know, don't label it abstract things. Make sure it's stuff that they know that they can look for. So if it's like reports, okay, sure, call it reports. If you call it insights, they might not get that. So that kind of thing, just remembering to keep it in their language as your users. Uh, again, we're treating this thing like a research project from the inside. Um, use your instincts. What's most useful to the organization? You're good at finding that kind of stuff because this is what you're good at doing. You're a researcher. Um, and do you need to create a place for them to bring things back when they find it? If they go out and do it, if my product manager goes out and does a, an interview, does she know where to put those notes? Uh, you know, uh, do you need like a kind of waiting room landing space so that you can take those things and then organize them into whatever way you figured that works best for you and your organization? So those are the kinds of things that can help you to think about. Um, you, it's hard not to get too hung up on the planning at the beginning part and doing the ops, you know, uh, just figure out whatever way works best for you, whether or not you cannot function without that setup first, or whether or not you can just make some documents and then organize them later. Uh, but the bottom line is it's what's most useful to the people that are looking for the information. Um, you know, center the users and you're going to be okay. Um, so again, this is like the service design aspect. It's like the inside out shirt of UX. Uh, you know, you want to make sure things are working from the inside. Um, who are each of your audiences? What business languages do they speak? Uh, you want to ensure that your hard work is getting understood and actually used and not just glanced out once or like, thanks that you did a great job and then nobody ever sees it again. Uh, if it does start the conversation though, I would argue that it's still worth it. Uh, but you don't want to just be taking a box of deliverables. Like I have to have a journey map. I have to have this and that. If they're not using it, you don't have to have, I mean, as long as you're getting to the right place, as long as you're spending time with your actual users and bringing back that information and those insights, it doesn't really matter what shape it takes, as long as it's digestible and usable by those groups. Um, so again, you know, like what are their latent needs? What matters to them internally? What are the business goals? All of that kind of stuff. You know, if, if your user experience is new to your organization, your executives might not know what to ask for. So you're going to need to know, you know, study them, see what they need, what's important to them, figure out those latent needs. The same thing we do with real users, well, not real users, but the same thing we do with our regular users on the outside. Uh, what do they need? What do they need that they're not telling me? I need to watch what they do and not necessarily what they say. We know those are different things. And they might not get it at first. You might have to repeat things a couple months later. That's okay. This is a learning process. It might take a little bit to sink in. Uh, you know, you, it gives you a chance to try new things and iterate and see what works. That's what, again, what we're good at. We know how to do this. Uh, you want to gauge the space in your organization and the receptiveness and make that those inroads where you can. So I know we're getting close to time here. I just want to wrap up. Um, trust yourself. Is all I can say. Like, it, try not to be eclipsed by imposter syndrome, right? It it can be a little bit lonely if you're the only person there or one of the only two people there. You're the researcher. You have these unique and crucial set of skills. They brought you in here for a reason. There was a gap that they knew wasn't getting filled, and that is what your skills are here to do. You're here to add that value and bring that awareness. If you hit a wall and people aren't listening, you can try different ways, or maybe they're just never going to listen. <laughs> That's all you can leave. That is an option. Um, but, you know, do your best. And then if, if it's just really not, they're not getting the information and you can't abide not being able to do it, the, you know, the, the way that is the most true to you and your users, then, you know, maybe there's somewhere else that can use your, your gifts. Um, but, uh, you know, I was doubting what, you know, how useful the stuff that I was producing was. And we had a new, um, a product marketing person come online and she said, thank you so much for all the stuff you shared with me. It was a gold mine of user information. It's really helped me out so much. So, I mean, it is, if you're doing the good work, and again, no matter what shape it takes, as long as you're producing those insights and you're getting that really to the heart of what the user's needs are and the problems that you can solve, um, you know, that's what really matters. And we shouldn't get so hung up in like all of the processes and the maturity levels and the, 
you know, all of that kind of stuff. Because especially if this is a fledgling operation, you know, if you're the only UXer to begin with, uh, you've got to start from somewhere. And just look around, use your instincts and skills and figure out, you know, where you can do the most good. And, and you know, you'll, you'll be fine. So that's all I have. Um, I didn't make these slides, so this is all the information there. <laughs> I'm a researcher, not a designer. Um, but I don't know if we have time for questions. If we do, I'm happy to take them. If anybody wants to reach out on uh, LinkedIn, uh, it's super easy to find. Um, I don't think this is linked specifically, but feel free to reach out. I love talking shop. Always happy to talk to anybody about this. Um, so I really appreciate all of your time today. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of valuable information. We do have time for questions. We have 15 more minutes. So uh, any questions that you have, everybody, uh, put them in the chat and we'll take them from there. Uh, it was an interesting term that you coined there, Amanda, uh, perfectionist procrastinator. I'd never heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, I think there are maybe six types of perfectionists. There's oh, a classic perfectionist, procrastinator. I forget some of the others, but yeah, there are many, many stripes of perfectionists. Oh, I should look them up. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a great book. Be sure to take a look at it. Um, okay, everybody, uh, questions for Amanda. And if anybody's out in Seattle, we can get coffee. Just finally. Oh, yeah. It's finally starting to get outside. <laughs> Summer's here. The cruise ships are already lined up. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have about 15 more minutes. If we have questions, then there will be a 15 minute break. Um, probably a wrap. Let's take a look at the schedule. And one thing I'll mention while you're looking, um, for new people, for people that are new to research, um, or UX in general, um, finding local meetup groups is so useful and helpful. And you find that a lot of your peers are running into the same problems you do. Uh, you know, everybody wants more access to users, um, you know, not being believed sometimes, um, how to present information. There are so many things that your peer groups can can offer you if you're, especially in bigger cities, but anywhere. And so many of them are virtual too. Like I'm in a UX book group here and I'm also in some meetups. So all of that is really useful. So yeah, 15 minute break um, and then uh, a quick wrap up session in the stage area. We're in sessions right now. The wrap up will be in stage. Okay. okay. Question from Mandy. Oh yeah. So dovetail, I've heard good things about dovetail. Something that I see that is great about those kinds of um, platforms is that it can give you a very centralized place to put the interviews themselves. Transcription is saves so much time if you can get get it. I know some of that one, I can't remember if it's dovetail specifically or maybe content or something else, but they, they pick out insights for you. And that's going to be really interesting as we get into AI and stuff, like how it might help us find some of those patterns. Um, so, you know, it might shorten the time span. Um, I've had to be scrappy and my colleagues and I have had uh, not a lot of budget for tooling. So we've had to do a lot of things manually ourselves. Um, if you can get the buy-in for it, and that could be your central repo as far as like, you know, here's where all the recordings are sitting, here's where all of the notes are sitting. Um, and you might have to do a walkthrough intro with your product team to be like, we, I've started using Dovetail, here's how to use it. That's something that I may have forgotten to mention in the presentation. So if you're using Figma as a design tool, for example, you want to have those meetings with your devs um, as far as like, they probably haven't used Figma. So you can say like, here's Figma, here's how to find the hex codes in here. Here's how to find all of this stuff. You, you might have to be the person that builds those bridges as far as like educating them on how to use the tools that you're using. Um, but a lot of places, like right now, my company works within Microsoft Universe, so it's like SharePoint, which I'm not as familiar with, and I actually do not like the experience of as much. <laughs> I miss Google. Um, so uh, you kind of have to go where they are sometimes if they're not as receptive, or if you try the new tool and they're just never going in there. They might want you to be like a librarian um, or, you know, where you bring them the information from it or they might want to go find it themselves. You kind of need to um, just kind of get a feel for the temperature and see how they want to find it and then see how they actually do. Because again, what they ask for and what they do might be different. I've sent out a survey before to say, how do you guys want the repo <laughs> to be organized? And then they didn't use it. So 
uh, you know, keep up, keep observing, keep seeing what they need. I didn't feel you about uh, Google there. <laughs> yeah, the Google suite is so much, I was spoiled in it and I didn't know. <laughs> it's just so much more intuitive. Uh, than than it. It by comparison. And no diss on any, if anybody's from Microsoft in this chat. Uh, <laughs> I do have a question for you while we're waiting for another one to come in, um, Amanda. If, if you're in a company that does not have an established uh, research, either department or team or process, how long do you think it can take to establish one? And what resources would, would, would someone need? That's a good question. It, it kind of depends on the reception, right? It depends on if they say they want UX and really kind of aren't going to make room for it. And that's more of a struggle. Uh, if you have influential people, like our CEO is like, we want to listen to the users. And I'm like, great, <laughs> that opens up so many doors because I can harken back to that point. Um, but, you know, if you have people that are like, yeah, yeah, UX is important, uh, it really kind of depends. Like we're, you try things and then if they do or don't work, you just keep moving along. I would say at my current organization, within about six months, uh, we probably, my our other organization, the one that my friend Susan here and I were in, uh, they were, you know, gave us carte blanche. They were wide open to the idea, but sometimes we have trouble getting like budgeting because it was new. You know, it's harder, like if we're not as business savvy to make that financial case and do the business proposition, I think that kind of stuff is, if you're good at it, it helps you get that buy-in faster. Sometimes like in my current organization, I feel like they're, they're still looking at me as product validation they're still not really seeing the benefit of the strategic research beforehand and how much that can save you. So if we're a clock, we're starting at like three or four, I think. And I think it's going to have to be a whole cycle until they see the results out on the other side, see where we could have mitigated risk, see where it does support the vision. Like sometimes you have to kind of do one or two of the, the pancakes that don't come out quite if they're not receptive to it. And that takes more time. And I mean, I don't want them to have to do that. I don't, I want everybody to do it the right way the first time because it's easier and faster and better for everybody. But if they're really not listening, then you can take stock at the end and um, it takes longer, but then you can still show that value. Just like our users on the outside want to see the value. We don't want innovation theater, you know, um, then on the, um, you know, once they see the proof in the pudding, so to speak, it can take longer. But uh, as long as you have that evidence, uh, not in a confrontational way, but as long as you like can show that where where you could have mitigated some of that risk, um, then that helps. Uh, but if everything's great and everybody's ready and willing to do it, it's probably every new product that comes along. Um, you know, every new feature, net new product that you can do, start the whole cycle and start the research at the beginning and do all of that work. Because we all know that it saves more money and time at the beginning. Um, you know, does that answer your question or did I go all over the place there? <laughs> Great, thank you. Let's see if there are any more coming in. Do you think it's enough to start um, with just one or two UXers? I think so. I think you can do, I mean, it's like one or two users, you know, the difference between zero and one is a huge leap. So, um, you know, it's uh, nicer if you don't have to wear all the hats at once. Uh, like for example, the product marketing person that just came in, she's going to be able to do so much of uh, like competitive research that I won't have to do. Um, so that kind of thing is useful. Like her and I can work in concert and help each other versus one over the other of us having to do everything. <laughs> so, right. but if you have a, you know, a designer or two and a researcher, that's the paradigm that I've been in both times. And, uh, you know, you can do a lot of good there and you can really make the impression. And once they see the good work, usually you can get padded in, like, the, you know, more heads will get added and it'll just grow from there. And then you can be an apple, you know, <laughs> you can be somebody who's a, a six on the maturity scale where they really prioritize and it dif you're a differentiator at that point. You can really disrupt and all the things that the executives say they want to do, you can get to that stage, um, you know, if you really invest in your research team and your UX team, because it's so important. I mean, I feel like we're so often kind of like clawing for relevance, but the truth is we are the most relevant people because if you're not doing it for users, who are you building any of this stuff for? 
you know? I mean, it's the most crucial component of it. And, you know, you don't want them to just kind of grit their teeth and use your products. You want them to be good. You, you don't want to get, um, you know, overtaken by some competitor that invests more in UX than you do, you know? <laughs> Not saying you would. I know you never would do that, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> but we know we feel it all around us you know every time we see our parents struggle on a website you know every time we use printer that should work that doesn't you know there are so many things that could be easier and you know it it's because someone made a decision to not invest uh if it's frustrating you know it's hard really over you even though we always blame ourselves if something doesn't work mm -hmm. But there's a reason Apple's Apple. There's a reason people go to Disney World. There's a reason why people drive Ferraris. The experience is so important. And we know that, but we need to convey that to everybody else in the organization. Right. That is so true, actually. Right. I don't think any questions are coming in. Um, oh, there's one. You're right, Susan. Yep. <laughs> you guys can already tell how uh, I'm a big fan of Susan, uh, but she, <laughs> even in the chat, she's like a beam of literal light. Uh, so I'm pro Susan. <laughs> yeah, you're totally right. It touches everything now, and it's only going to get more and more. I mean, the more technology we're going to have, the more it touches everything in our lives. There's that every, every one of those is an inflection point for an experience, uh, you know, experience research, experience design, mm -hmm. um, you know, to make it better. It doesn't have to be terrible. We don't have to live this way. <laughs> we, we can have nicer things that are easier to use for everybody. Like Seattle just got a transit app for the first time last year and we live in a tech hub. But the reason why is because those people don't have to take the bus, you know, at, so there are so many opportunities out there to help or help nonprofits or, you know, make the world better. Yep. Uh, we're definitely going to get into an uncanny valley situation with UI or AI. I think uh, <laughs> the guy who wrote throwing rocks at the Google bus, I can't remember his name, but he was saying how like, you know, the home field advantage for us is here in the real world. And it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, you know, I don't think that the people that are like the thought leaders and all up at the top, uh, you know, the, the Musks and the, you know, the Bezos, well, not uh, Zuckerberg, you know, all of those guys, I don't know how much they're thinking about, you know, you can only disrupt and innovate so much um, until before you leave people behind and then who's using it and what, you know, I was reading a, a there's a book of, I forget what it's called exactly. I know I've mentioned lots of books and podcasts. Yes, Metaverse, um, I'm more, of AR versus VR, but I still think that there's, we're going to have to figure it out, you know? I mean, the iPhones are less than 20 years old. I think 10 years ago is when Web 2.0 really came into being with all the social media stuff. So we're learning as we're going. I mean, I think curation is going to be really big in the future because we just can't can't take all of this in. There's no, it, for me, um, you know, it's not time that I don't have, which I mean, you know, we're all, I'll have finite time, but it's attention. I don't have enough attention and brain power uh, at the end of the day. And it's because all of my time confetti is sucked up by all of these things. So, uh, you know, they're not going to stop. So how do I figure out for my, per you know, to be a human being, how is my experience better? You know, how do I figure out how to reduce uh, friction for being not online so much and add in friction for being online too much? You know, like if you set a timer on your Instagram or hide it or put it in another folder, so that it's not so easy to get to, um, you know, how we can design it around ourselves and our knowing ourselves and our patterns and knowing how we can kind of like level the playing field a little bit, because uh, as Bill Burnham said, they're coming for every second. <laughs> so how can we, how can we um, you know, win back a little bit of that attention? Because that is finite. Your brain glucose is finite. We know that as researchers, like we, you know, the cognitive load can be too much and we, we need to figure out how to leave space for ourselves in our brain. Uh, Manoush Samaridi wrote a book called Bored and Brilliant where she talks about the value of being able to get bored. She has exercises where you're supposed to sit and watch a pot of water boil. And, uh, you know, like 
you're going to hate it because it's so boring, but like, uh, what can come out of it? What daydreaming can do for us? Like clawing back some of those spaces, um, you know, the mental spaces so that we're not just totally overwhelmed and flattened every day, all day, because that's not doing us any good, you know? All right. Definitely. Well, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, apps even coming out, um, urging us to take some time off and have a work-life mm -hmm. balance and take care of our mental well-being. So definitely. Yeah. Definitely yeah. Need there. Yeah. So much opportunity. We'll see yeah. where we get to. <laughs> but I'm excited for it. We don't have to be nihilistic like the people in um, in the thing. We can, uh, <laughs> we can be optimistic and try to make a better version for ourselves. Yep. Definitely. Um, I think we're right at time here, actually. Um, thanks, thank, thanks, everybody, for a great discussion. Thanks for the questions and comments. And thank you, Amanda, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, lots of valuable information there. Um, I hope everybody uh, enjoys the rest of the conference and the upcoming two days. Um, and again, uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>